Read the word of God. Amen. Amen. And so you help us read it. Genesis 24, verse 42. Bless the Lord. When I came, when I came to the spring today, I said, Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will, please grant success to the journey on which I have come. See, I am standing beside the spring. If a young woman comes out to draw water, and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jar, and if she says yes to me, drink, and I will draw water for your candles too, let her be the one the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Who has chosen? The Lord. So underline that. You know, many people, I understood what the Genesis Greek said, and many people misunderstand. And they think God is no more in the business of marriage. Please repeat and continue. Verse number 43. See, I am standing beside this spring. If a young woman comes out to draw water and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jar. And if she says to me, drink, and I will draw water for your candles too, let her be the one the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Amen. Continue. 45. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out. He, 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 he prayed in his heart. When you are looking for a sign from the Lord as a confirmation to anything, you don't alter audibly. Because your noise will not open God's ears. The position of your heart will. The position of your heart will. And so he did not open his mouth to pray. He prayed in his heart. Why? Because if you open your mouth, humans can hear and demons can. And so they can give you an answer. But it is only God who holds the heart of him. It is only God who knows what is in the heart. Satan does not know what is in your heart. In one of my books I said, he can throw an arrow. And if you give that arrow attention, then he can discover your thoughts. But if you do not give him an attention, he will never know your thoughts, nor what is in your heart. Amen. Amen. And so when you are praying about anything, and you bring them before the Lord, and you need a confirmation to be sure, the signs we do not open our mind. We say them in our heart. And the God we said, the God of the Bible, hears what is said in the heart. I thought I had some in the heart. Amen. It's the only God that hears what is said in the heart. And his name is Jesus. In the book of John chapter 2, the Bible says he knows the heart of all men. Please continue. Verse 45. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water. And I said to her, Please give me a drink. She really lowered her jar on her shoulder and then said, Drink, and I will water your candles too. And so, what he said in his heart to the Lord. I pray that God will help somebody to understand how important it is to involve God in whatever you do. The man just said things in his heart. Rebecca was not there, nobody heard. But God engineered the thought of the heart into manifestation. God dropped the heart desire of the man because it was his will. In the heart and the mind of Rebecca. So at the end of the day, that which the man was expecting God to do, materialized. 
Please continue. Verse 47. I asked her, who is the daughter of Mary? She said, the daughter of Bethel, son of Nahor, whom Bilkan bore to him. Then I put the ring in her nose in the Christmas of her house. And I bowed down and worshipped the Lord. I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother. So who led him? The Lord. Lord. The Bible says he's the one who ordered the steps of the righteous. If you involve him, he will guide you. Amen. Amen. He is real. God is authentic. Isn't how do you believe I have not seen him? You don't need to see God. Is that the sun? We see the sun and we say there is the sun. How does the blind man describe the sun? But he believes there is a son because he feels. God will reveal himself to you and you alone will know that there is God. You don't need anybody to tell you that there is no controversy. You cannot deny the fact that there is God. You can't. And it is my prayer before you leave here, you've made up your mind to know him. For he is near. Amen. Verse 49. Now, if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so I may know which way to turn. Labor and Victor answered, This is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebecca. Take her and go, and let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has directed. Verse 52. So like we saw, the father consented to everything. But the father does not have the right to accept. Because the father is not the one going into the marriage. And so let's see from the Bible what we did. Yeah, please continue. And he now said to him, what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. And the servant brought out gold and silver jewelry and articles of clothing and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. The mother here simply appearance. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessings upon the reading of the word. Like I said earlier, what you have seen. It's not African tradition, it's God's tradition. Amen. God instituted marriage, not man. And man cannot go into it the way he wants and have God's support. It does not work that way. In the beginning, in Genesis chapter 2, it was God who played the role of the father. For Adam, and he also played the same role for Eve. But the man must give something. We call that which the man gives dowry. And so the list that was given that we saw then, you know, manifested that beautiful things we saw. Is down. And I have a good news for Russell. What happened today is the marriage, it's not engagement. Yes. He is your wife. Amen. Yes. Because in Hebrew, when such things happen, you can only reverse it by divorce. You cannot just change it with math. The Hebrew word I think is shidu king. Shidu king. S H I D D U K I N. Shidu king. 
It is a legal term, a legal word. Even though when you get married in this order, sometimes according to the Jewish culture, not the Bible culture, in the Jewish culture you stay away for about a year for about two or a third reasons. First, to be sure that the girl did not mess up. You are not trying to cover up a pregnancy. And so they give it about a year. And second, for you to have the chance to prepare yourself for the wedding feast. And so the, the, the woman will be in her mother's side or parent's side, the man will be in his parent's side, and you are preparing yourself for that big day. But the wedding feast that brings many people together is not the marriage. What we have seen is the marriage. The marriage is the consent of two families. Even what God did, the uncle of Jacob also did the same thing. There wasn't any Isaac in Genesis chapter 29. It was the uncle of Jacob who played the father of Jacob and also played the father of his daughters. The same way God did. But the truth of the matter is you must give something. Let me tell you something. I don't want to spend my time. I just want to make a point. The tradition we, be, we hold high must not contradict the word of God. We have three types of marriage that which we just saw. It has about three phases. The knocking we talk about. The knocking is making your intentions known to the bride's family. And so it paved the way for engagement and caution. Because you cannot know someone well only when you meet the person on the street. And so the parents must give you the room to know yourself. And so when you make your intentions known through the knocking, then you can go to the house, the parents know your intention. You can meet the person on the street and when you are talking or chatting, the parents can see and buy a greeting. But it now becomes engagement. What is engagement? Preoccupied. You have gotten the thing and you have put it there for an appointed time. So you are studying yourselves. And so because it's an engagement, the both of you are preoccupied. There is no space on you anymore as a man for any other woman, as a woman for any other man. So it's engagement. The person is preoccupied when you see the person pass. But after three to six months, sometimes even a year, when you agree, the both of you agree to marry, that is when the parents of the man will go and confirm their thoughts. The both have consented to marry, so then they will give you, the bride's family will give you the list, the customary rights, which becomes a dowry. And so at the end of the day, traditional marriage comes, like we have seen, and it's a marriage. Another marriage is what we see in the church. Let me quickly make some correction. What you have seen has nothing to do with the church. It's two families. They could have decided no pastor would be around. When you, they came to me, I told you that even at first, this kind of thing, when I was growing up, I'm about 50 now, I saw that this kind of thing was done between maybe the father, the uncle, a brother, and a friend. The father, uncle, a brother, and a friend. Both sides. And it takes place very early in the morning, maybe 5 a.m. By 6, 6.30 in the morning is done. But things are changing. Amen. Amen. And so, it can be that they will do it this way in their home. 
Nobody will be there. No pastor will be there. So I, the, the, the marriage we are witnessing is not the church. Marriage is family. Marriage is family. Those who were privileged to be there in Breda when I ministered at Pastor Ben's uh, daughter's, uh, not the word, but the tradition, I made things clear. And you get this as part two. Marriage is family. And there is a reason to that. Apart from the marriage of the church also, there is the marriage of the state, the court, the legal marriage. The legal Marriage or the court does not recognize what happened here today. But God does. The court does not. Neither does the court recognize what happened in the church. Where we exchange vows and do all the things. It is necessary to do it as a Christian after this with a family in the church because the church, the Bible says, is also a family. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Vision chapter 3, verse number 14 and 15. The church is a family. It's a community. And so after doing this, you must also have the chance. But we are not talking about preparing big, spending a lot of money. You can do your marriage, this official marriage today, and Sunday, tomorrow, you bring it to church. My Two, six weeks. The Jews, it takes a year. But you can do it a day after. As far as you bring it before the prophet, it's consecrated. We do that because we are children of God. And we bring them before the prophet, where the altar God meets with his people. And so this traditional one, which is indeed married, if the person is not a Christian, he's finished. He has his wife. He's gone. What I need to say in conclusion is the fact that even though we respect all these three types of marriages, the traditional one we have just seen, the church one, and that of the law, the law of the state does not recognize the church, marriage, they don't recognize that of the tradition. But because God does, it will be wrong for you to get married and bring it as a surprise to your parents. Yeah, that is how people interpret Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. For the man will leave his father and mother, cleave to the wife, and they become one flesh. And so they can go out, and the state law will permit you. Even if your parents are not there, they can permit you. All they need is a witness. But if you are a Christian, you don't need anyone's approval or bear God. We saw from the Bible, it was God who ordered his steps. And so even when you finish doing that of the church, you can still do that of the state, which we recommend. But one thing we want you to understand is marriage is for Adam and Eve. It's not for Adam and Thomas. It's not for Eve and Stephanie. That is what God is saying to the church. And Jesus said it was not so from the beginning. That way God instituted in Genesis chapter 2 must go through time with all generations. It is God's agenda. The man must give something to have a wife. And the last thing I want to say is the marriage must be consummated. Until the man and the wife meet. It's not yet completed. It's not a complete marriage. When they meet, there are two covenants in marriage. What we have seen is not a covenant. The two covenants, one is the blood tie, consummation. You give yourself the man in you to the woman, and she receives you into the woman in her. And she also gives you herself. And so you are no more two. 
Because she has entered into you. You have her in you. And yet you walk as an individual. And you have given yourself to her. And she has you in her. And she walks as an individual. So the Bible says the two become one. And they feel no shame. The second covenant is you will be committed to each other. This is where I am landing. You will be committed to each other through God. Any relationship that is not committed through God will crash. If you are committed to your spouse, will the person follow you 24-7? That if you are faithful to God, you will preserve and you will keep and you will protect and you will do everything to make it work. Amen. Because everywhere you, you are, whether you are alone, there is an unseen being. The witness. God says something in, uh, is it Malachi? I think Malachi chapter 2. If I can read for us, please. Malachi chapter 2, verse number 14, and we are close. Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. You ask why. You ask why. If you want to understand, read verse 13, but we are not reading it. You ask why. Because you never saw God's involvement. And so you may ask why. But God is giving an, an answer. What is God saying? You ask why. This is because the Lord is the witness between you and your wife. The Lord is the witness. And so you are not committed just to your wife or your husband. You are committed to that person to God. He is the witness. And the witness is the one who can testify whether against you or for you. I wish. It confirms a Christmas chapter 4. We are not reading. And so I want you to understand in marriage it goes far more than what we see. Marriage involves God. And if you want your marriage to stand, it's not how many books you read. It's not how beautiful your wife is or how strong you are in bed. If you want it, last time I was saying something to my wife, the biggest or the largest house in the world, over $500 million. The man, before he finished the house, the wife divorced him. <laughs> and so I asked myself, is it about money? And so your money will not save the, 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 the marriage, the God will. Yes. We need money. We need to be strong as men in bed. Women must be beautiful. But it, 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 these things do not keep marriage open. It is God who holds all things together and things fall apart when the center can not hold and the center of every good thing is God. Amen. Rise to you. No one can destroy whom the Lord
inviting me to your life and say, help me. You don't need Jesus just to fix your mind. You don't need Jesus just to get well. You need Jesus for heaven, salvation, to escape God's wrath. But when you get it, he is a castle, every other thing you need, you will find in him. For God so loved us, he did not give us houses. He gave us Jesus, because in him, and by him, and for him, all things were created. If you get Jesus, you've gotten it all. I want us to thank God for what you have heard. We give you all glory, honor, and adoration. We are grateful unto you for what you have done and what you are still doing and about. We give you all the praise. We thank you for your work. If any of us is struggling in marriage, we pray that you will give us the wisdom to work on it. Heal marriage. We pray in Jesus. We pray in Jesus.